Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Queens is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. Uh, my name is Romina Cortina, and I am an MPA candidate with the School of Policy Studies. I'd like to welcome you all to our speaker series events and extend a special welcome to our professional MPA students. Um, in addition to me being student moderator today, um, we are integrating Slido into the event. So after our speaker has concluded his lecture, we'll take questions from both the audience and from Slido. You can post your questions by going to slido.com and putting the SPS uh, code into the website. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Hugh Siegel, the fifth head of Massey College at the University of Toronto, where he is a senior fellow. He was a former chair of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee and Special Senate Committee on Anti-Terrorism. He also has served as Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Mulroney, Associate Cabinet Secretary for Feder Federal Provincial Relations in Ontario under Premier William Davis, and as President of the Institute for Research on Public Policy in Montreal. He is a senior strategic advisor at the Erdin Burles Law Firm and a distinguished fellow at both the Monk School of Global Affairs and the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University. He graduated from the University of Ottawa with a degree in history in 1972. His public policy focus for many years has been reforming income security in Canada with, base, with a basic income guarantee. His foreign policy focus as chair of the NAO Council of Canada and co-chair of the Democracy 10 International Strategy Forum, grouping 10 major democracy countries in defense and promotion of two core freedoms, from fear and from want. He has written seven books on public policy and ho holds honorary doctorates from the University of Ottawa and the Royal Military College. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much where we're gonna end. <laughs> We had some slight revisions right before, so I'm kind of going on the fly. <laughs> oh, he also just wrote a proposal published by Ontario for a, a, the pilot project on basic income, and I, this introduction, I hope, doesn't fail to acknowledge how awesome this man is. <laughs> uh, without further ado, who Siegel. Uh, Ms. Cortina, thank you for that introduction. It's great to be home. Um, this school accepted me as a refugee from the Mulroney government <laughs> uh, in 1993. I just, let's get the history correct. The government was still the government. Miss Campbell had not yet succeeded in taking us from 158 seats to two um, in the election that followed. But when I, and when I left the government uh, to come here, um, we were at 38% in the polls. Um, during most of my time as his chief of staff, we were at about 7% in the polls, which meant that more people thought Elvis Presley was alive <laughs> than were planning to vote um, for Mr. Mulroney. And I, I, I blame Peter Milliken for that. A lot of times. <laughs> consistently the most popular MP in this constituency. He didn't only win more votes than um, any of the other candidates running against him, he won more votes than all of them combined, which I thought was a touch piggy, but that's okay. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about, what do you need? What is, what is it? <laughs> Just have to open this up. Why? <laughs> so Slido will work. <laughs> why, do, why do you, okay. So where do I put, what do I, what, what do those of us who use paper do? Okay, fine, right thanks. There. Sorry. <laughs> you see how civilization erodes so simply? <laughs> you think you're in a safe place and all of a sudden, <laughs> do I have to press any buttons? No, we're done. Thank God, okay. <laughs> um, today what I'd like to do in the time we have is talk a little bit about why the liberal democratic world order that we grew up with since the end of World War II is in such difficulty. Talk a little bit about how it happened, and then talk a little bit about what we perhaps need to do. The reason I would uh, waste your time on a PMPA Friday with this particular topic is because I think the, uh, the um, <coughs> reduction of the salience of the liberal democratic world order is now producing some jarring anomalies and discordant contexts around the world that are actually quite threatening to our own way of life 
and the kind of world I think Canadians generally would like to see. The broad consensus of the value of the liberal rules-based trading relationships that promoted um, but uh, not necessarily succeeded completely in promoting improved but not absolute freedom of movement for people and ideas and capital and goods and services is clearly eroding before our very eyes. That millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in Europe and Asia by the rules-based international economic and trade systems is unassailable, but it has little impact on the pro-protectionist bias <coughs> exemplified by the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom or the present protectionist mindset, however erratic, in the White House. Even the general trend towards democracy and enhanced freedom and human rights advanced by the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Berlin Wall actually is stalled if not dead in its tracks. Russia and China, whatever should be praised about aspects of their economic progress, have both chosen to advance non-democratic authoritarian views about how their governments and global networks should operate. In both cases, democracy and human rights are viewed typically as an unavoidable, as an avoidable destination. Minority rights, tolerance for dissent, free press do not exist in those two countries, for better or for worse. The one belt, one road global development engagement of our Chinese friends, while not by any means all negative, is about extending the economic and trade networks of China around the world on China's terms. Those terms are by no means evil, but they have little room for democracy, human rights, or freedom for minorities. Backed by a robust military buildup, unequaled in terms of annual growth rates and weaponization of the South China Sea, of which China's claim to exclusive sovereignty is deeply questionable, the expansion of Chinese global naval reach and general cooperation tactically, strategically with Russia, China's stance is a direct challenge, well thought out and well financed for the liberal democratic rules-based order built in the post-war years. <coughs> Russia has been on a revanchist road since the Orange Revolution that tried to save democracy in the Ukraine. In Ukraine, I'm sorry. That road has meant the illegal seizure of Crimea, the buildup of Russian forces on their western border, supporting unrivaled and war criminal dictators like Assad, the clear Russian war crimes of bombing civilians to smithereens in Aleppo, and now working with Iran and Turkey to destabilize the Middle East with what I call a Pax Putinesca that will give comfort to the Iranians, their terrorist allies, preserve Assad in power, and destabilize places that deserve to live their own national lives, like Lebanon. None of which even begins to address the buildup of Russian military and strategic capacity in the Arctic on our own northern border. Now we do need to be fair. Both China and Russia are filling a vacuum. Whatever may be the truth about Russian cyber meddling in the Brexit referendum or the US presidential election, the fact is that Britons voted to leave Europe and Americans voted to elect Mr. Trump. Can't blame Russia for all of that, or China. Turkish domestic crackdowns on the judiciary, on journalists, on students and professors cannot be blamed on Russia or China, although the style employed by the government in Ankara is more totalitarian than it is democratic and much more normative in Russia and China than it is in the countries of the West. The fact remains from Myanmar to the Philippines, from Turkey to sub-Saharan Africa, there is a new totalitarianism, a new authoritarianism, operating without significant check or restraint. If anything, the Russians and Chinese reach out to encourage and do business with those very authoritarian administrations. Part of the liberal democratic rules-based order that no longer works is the UN Security Council. It has been wildly impotent in the Middle East and unable with the EU to manage the tide of migration coming across the Mediterranean. When agencies are unable to act, borders seem meaningless, people will vote to erect 
new walls out of fear. If you are China or Russia, more walls between allies make picking them off one by one in a trade or strategic bilateral negotiation much easier. The post-war world of liberal democratic order was about alliances on defense and trade, restricting the incentive for aggression and encouraging economic growth and wealth distribution. When the infrastructure principles of the liberal democratic world were negotiated, they were negotiated by Prime Minister Churchill and President Roosevelt off the shores of Newfoundland in the middle of World War II, aboard battleships that had sailed there in secrecy in August of 1941. And the document they negotiated, the Atlantic Charter, was based on two freedoms, freedom from want and freedom from fear. These are the freedoms that lie at the base of all the other freedoms we take for granted. Freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of expression. And in my view, every human being in the world, at a bare minimum, has the right to these two freedoms. Sustaining those freedoms was attempted through the creation of NATO, the United Nations, the World Bank, the WTO, the IMF, and other bodies of global remit and reach central to an infrastructure supporting rules-based approach to managing trade and security and commerce and development worldwide. It was by no means perfect. But the rebuilding of a democratic and economically robust Europe and Japan was achieved to the benefit of the entire world. Decolonization of Africa and Asia also made substantial progress. While that multicultural structure in support of the freedoms served well and the durability for many years, and with durability for many years, eclipsing the hard left cultural revolution that plagued China for years, deflecting the totalitarian communism of the old Soviet Union that died with the end of the Berlin Wall, mistakes were made. And we would be good to reflect on them because the effect of those mistakes are haunting us now. Rebuilding Europe, stabilizing the military adventurism to, um, through democracy of the old Soviet Union, facilitating the post-war move from colonialism to democracy in many parts of Asia and Africa did happen and that does count for a lot. The massive creation of post-war wealth in North America, Europe and Asia was both epic, historic and constructive. But key gaps were absolutely unaddressed and key opportunities were missed, usually for reasons of narrow, self-seeking ideology. The growth of Chinese influence, economic capacity and wealth should well have necessitated an institutional change at the UN, the IMF and the World Bank to reflect China's growing power and influence. China more directly asked for those changes on an ongoing basis. It deserved more status and did so some time ago. Those requests were ignored. We are paying the price for that now. The provisions of the NATO treaty that called for economic engagement around a more even-handed approach to investment, economic well-being, have never ever been engaged across the membership of NATO. NATO decided that those parts of the treaty didn't matter. It was all about guns and boats and planes and arms, none of which was necessarily unnecessary to restrain the Soviets. We avoided a thermonuclear war without a shot being fired, but the economic issues were simply not addressed, and the gaps in wealth distribution throughout the West ensued as a result. All the efforts of the Western world that we have put into economic growth and expansion had little time or space for improving distribution across populations. Within many countries, the gap between rich and poor is too large. We see how that plays out when the United States Midwest votes for Mr. Trump. One third of French voters chose Le Pen at the runoff ballot. We have not innovated on more equitable distribution of wealth in the countries of the West, certainly in this country, since the 1970s. That's almost half a century ago. 
China and Russia cannot be faulted for advancing their own interests, both opportunistically and strategically. And now as we sit here this afternoon, and the West obsesses with both profound and shallow, but absolutely overwhelming domestic controversies, Russia and China, untroubled by the vagaries of public opinion or media concern in their countries, advance their strategies worldwide acting to acquire de facto control of the Middle East in the former's case, or continuing to encircle India, our democratic partner in Asia, in the latter case. While the West, self-absorbed, withdrawn from the great game, the battle between authoritarian and democratic regimes around the world, we maintain that self-obsession, and therefore the forces of darkness make progress on a steady and ongoing basis. What needs to happen to rebalance will not happen soon. Beyond Brexit, beyond whatever the Trump phenomena, whenever the Trump phenomena dilutes, a new coherent strategy for the worldwide protection of the two freedoms will matter the most. And countries like Canada, like our Scandinavian friends, like India, and others like-minded need to start to work now on what that strategy should be and how it must emerge and when. When their short-term challenges dissipate, the United Kingdom, the EU, the United States can come aboard. In my view, the strategy should be based on four essential pillars. One, an enlightened global policy on income security that can bridge the effect of existing unfair wealth gaps and harness and, if necessary, regulate new technologies for the common good. Two, a genuine war on the production of greenhouse gas to dilute and alleviate the worst impacts of climate change which are already beginning at a serious pace. Three, a new security architecture based on a mix of Western strength and coherence across all theaters of potential conflict and aggression. Space, cyber, on and under the seas, proxy terrorist engagement and the rest that reaches out first to Russia and China for cooperation and failing that plans a new framework of restraint and control to keep those forces within some framework of stability. And fourth, institutional change in global agencies to better reflect the strength of Russia and China, the emergence of new economic power in Africa and Asia, and make sure that those governments' right to a proportionate say for the people they represent is better reflected in our international institutions than is the case as we sit here this afternoon. Let me offer a final word before I take questions or personal attacks, which I, which I assume will come through this computer or something. something <laughs> that, most personal attacks do these days. Don't you find that? So, we can only do this Canada as a middle power if we are realistic about our capacities and focused about our intentions. I give Prime Minister Trudeau great credit for how he has managed the uh, NAFTA uh, negotiations with the United States. You have to work on two assumptions. The Americans are a rational trade negotiator seeking to maximize their advantage. I think everything that can be done to array a series of constructive engagement opportunities on that process is being done and has been done. If the second proposition is more dominant, an irrational partner looking to break whatever they can in the China shop just so they could turn back to their voters in Wisconsin and Ohio and say, see, we told you we could break stuff and we've broken stuff, then we have to count on the ability of the United States Senate and Congress not to quickly pass any instrument of abrogation, which the White House might recommend, as the 38 states that have Canada as its largest client, as their largest clients, decide to intervene to slow down that process. I don't think the government of Canada could have done anything better than what they are now doing, and I think our Prime Minister deserves credit for having that kind of multifaceted strategy. A more interesting question is the question about the Security Council seat for Canada at the United Nations. I can't imagine any Canadian Prime Minister not wanting to have a seat on the Security Council. 
But it's important that we keep a measure of perspective. We will be a temporary member on an organization where the five permanents actually have all the power. We may get to make an interesting speech. I remember George Ignatieff, God rest his soul, making an interesting speech during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's not without value, maybe without effect, however. The question is, what do we give up in the internal politics of the UN, where we are currying favor with a group of powers, some of whom we disagree with fundamentally, on issues like gay rights, on issues like diversity, on issues like the free movement of a good and people, goods and people and idea, in order to have a shot at that seat. I'm sure the Prime Minister is arraying the forces that he should. I think he should be using more of our former ambassadors, more of our NGO people with wonderful linkages. I'll give you one tiny story that indicates how important that is. When Mr. Harper was Prime Minister, in an act of some uncharacteristic open-mindedness, the North Koreans were sent, were invited to send a delegation to Canada for discussions. While they were in the air, Kim Jong-un said something that had that invitation withdrawn. <coughs> so here we have the joy Politicians from North Korea flying to Canada, nothing official for them to do when they land. Foreign Affairs is a competent operation, or whatever it's called now, Global Affairs, Foreign Affairs. They reached out to the United Nations Association of Canada as a very strong infrastructure, chapters right across the country. They said, sure, we'll be glad to help. They were there. They met the visiting politicians. They set up meetings at universities. They set up meetings with existing non-government politicians, the Senate, the legislature, meeting with academics who'd study Korea. Very constructive three days took place. And one of the members of that delegation is North Korea's foreign minister, as we sit here today. And the contact that he will rely on most is the woman who's the president of the United Nations Association of Canada. Those linkages really matter. And if the government is serious about the Security Council seat, it should be thinking about all talents on board, sending ministers to meeting is good, getting ministers out of Ottawa is always good, it's always <laughs> constructive. But you really need to have a much broader uh, measure if you're going to have the impact that's appropriate. The final word I would offer you relates to Canada's capacity. Development in terms of aid, diplomatic in terms of the strength and depth of our diplomatic corps across the world. Military, in terms of our capacity to deploy for humanitarian, peacekeeping, alliance support, or other reasons. Cutting those capacities back is one way to ensure that Canada's voice is diminished. My experience with the Foreign Service of this country is that, by and large, they are all extremely hardworking, very dedicated, and determined people. But when you go through a cycle which began when I was uh, in the Senate, and Mr. Harper was Prime Minister, of selling off residences so that you begin to remove the instruments and the tools that the diplomats use to build networks in their respective countries in Canada's interest. And you justify that by saying, well, we don't have any money for our trade commissioners to entertain anyway, so what do they need an apartment for? <laughs> Understand that circular logic. You begin to say to the world, well, good folks, Canada, Premier Notley said, Right? Big hat, no cattle. That's the problem that we face. The Americans are doing it willfully for reasons I don't actually understand, because it can't be about the money. But in our case, it's about being penny wise and pound foolish. We've done that to our military, and we've done that to international development. When I started in the Senate in 2005, we were spending five billion a year in international development, perhaps not as efficiently as we might, but the effort was real and the engagement was genuine. That number is now way less than four billion. It should not be declining in the face of all the issues that I referenced and you have been studying in some of your programs here today. Now is the time to sustain and consolidate and build our capacity. Um, if Canada is back is to mean something, and I believe the Prime Minister who said it was genuine, we have to have the capacity to make a difference. And if we do away with that capacity, Bob Ray used to ask the wonderful question, foreign aid, more MRI machines. Who do you think is going to win that debate? Well, at least let's have the debate. Let's at least have the discussion about what's a more appropriate use of public funds 
in the long-term interest of our kids and our grandchildren and the environment and the world we hope to share. Uh, I am in your hands for questions and personal attacks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are you going to be the, uh, you're going to pick out the people, you're going to flip, what are you going to do something? I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm going to do my best. All right. I'm taking over question period. Good. Perfect. Um, I guess we'll start with our Slido questions. So one that's topping the list, <coughs> who is our best democratic ally in the creation of this world protection strategy you spoke of? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you want a country as opposed to an individual, I guess. Um, I would probably say, um, in Asia, I would say, <coughs> in Asia, I would say the Indians are our best allies, and we should be deepening that relationship every chance, every opportunity we can for a whole bunch of reasons. They are generally being viewed in terms of economic prospects as having long-term better growth prospects than our Chinese friends because they are a democracy. They have a system where there is commercial and other laws that operate in a way that is relatively normative, all things considered. They have challenges. It's slower. They have a measure of corruption, but the progress that they have made with respect to the alleviation of poverty in their own population is very compelling, and their openness to democracy as a, as, a, as a determinant of how they go forward, I think is fundamental. In Europe, um, I guess my, my core view is that the British will reemerge from their sort of Brexit insanity at some point, whether they reemerge as partially part of um, the EU or completely outside remains to be determined. I just spent some time in Great Britain and on both sides of the leave and remain debate, they have no idea what's going on. They are completely <laughs> at sea about where it's gonna go and how it's gonna end up and I wish them well. But I would say that in Europe, I would uh, probably look at our Scandinavian friends and the British and the French as the most stable and likely <coughs> to engage. And to be fair to the French who take a lot of heat for a lot of things, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, they have been prepared to engage, to try to protect people's lives. It is part of their old colonial empire, so I understand that remnant thing, but they have been prepared to engage. You know, most airports in those former French colonies have a thousand Lee Corn troops just there in case. Uh, those are the sorts of things which are helpful, and I think the French have as much of a grasp of democracy as perhaps we do here. Okay. Um, this next question, curbing greenhouse gases is a key pillar in restoring the liberal order. How should Canada go about including environmental provisions in NAFTA negotiations? Well, I, I'm not one of those who dismisses the government's decision to put environmental and other uh, progressive uh, priorities into our side of the negotiation. The assumption being that in a worst case scenario, where there was an agreement on the larger trade issues, there would probably be a side letter on the environment, on labor, on uh, full access to the economy for women. Uh, and we have done that before. Remember, every American president, George W. Bush, Mr. Clinton, <coughs> campaigned on redoing NAFTA. This is not a new mem from um, the Trump people. However, the others may have understood it better, perhaps, than the... the that being said, and there were negotiations, and there were side letters and other agreements reached to address legitimate concerns about upgrading and, and modernizing. Um, so I would argue that probably we need to move to an equivalency standard. So whether some states like California, some provinces like Ontario and Quebec go down one road in terms of how to manage carbon, and other parts of the country go down another road, we have to have some agreement about what does equivalency constitute. There's a wonderful principle which Tommy Cushane can explain better than anybody else in the world in terms of how we manage federalism. Quebec would say, that's a, that's a good program you guys are doing, that so national pension thing, it's really impressive, we won't be there. But we expect our share of the money and the answer was providing you have a program which meets on an equivalent basis the purposes of the national program that exists elsewhere. We should be putting together that kind of framework so the fact that different countries go at it in a different way, as long as there's a scientific basis for assessing the beneficial equivalency, we can make progress together. Failing that, it really does become a dog's breakfast. And we have a question from Bob Holt. 
Um, Canada hosts the G7 next year. Can we ask for one big issue on the agenda, and what should it be? Or we can ask for one now, big issue. Now, is, is that a question asked about a country that never had a G7, or a country that had two G7s and one G20, or is there a... I'm sorry, I'm just doing what Bob Wolf would have done to any student who asked that kind of question <laughs> in his seminar. You may not recall this, it's before your time, but I remember a graduation party here some years ago, and um, two of the graduating students um, did the walking into the class saying, good morning, Dr. Wolf. And he would say, is that good morning from someone who's never seen a good morning? Is that good morning from someone who has a particular view of what good mornings is? So much sun, so much temperature. Can you qualify that on the assumption that every good morning had to be a cabinet document? But, uh, <laughs> so no, I don't, I don't mean to be unkind, Robert. Um, however accurate that portrayal was. Um, I would say that if, uh, if, if I were, were in the unlikely circumstance that I was working for the present prime minister, um, I would argue that he needs to take the sum total of the things for which he has been fighting. So humanity with respect to refugees, um, uh, full rights around the issue of uh, First Nations, um, uh, full equivalency in terms of society as a whole for our uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, colleagues. Um, he has to take that out of the specific envelopes, which are not unattractive in and of themselves, and say there's, there's a value system here that should define what the G7 is about. It should be an underlying definition, and he should try to get a statement about those core values. Now, that would make the Sherpa's life from all the seven countries difficult. They'd begin negotiating the statement long before the meeting took place in Quebec. But when that statement came out, it would be a response to President of China's, uh, Premier of China's view that the West is failing and has no coherent view of how society should operate. The Putin view, essentially, that the West is weak, morally insecure, unable to defend what it stands for, doesn't know what it stands for. Easy for authoritarians to say that. It would be very good if the G7 said, no, actually, this is what we stand for. And some of it is a basis for cooperation with our Chinese and Russian friends, and some of it isn't. But that's what we stand for. If I were, if I were giving him advice, I would say, if you want to advance the Canadian view, use that meeting to do that. There will be subset agreements about migration po po power, po par, uh, uh, issues and refugees and all the rest, which is a good thing. But that general statement, I'd say, would be the most important thing that could emerge from Canada uh, uh, at a meeting under this Prime Minister's chairmanship. Thank you. Thank you.